Welcome back to Bumblebee for today's video on the top 10 unusual Viking marriage traditions. Tradition number 10 will be the gift of a blade. In 2015 and 2019, couples Rune and Elizabeth Dalsith and Dorian and Charlie Eust became two of the only couples in modern times to have authentic ancient Viking wedding ceremonies, complete with blood sacrifices, hog roasts, and swords. Swords, while it may come as a surprise or not given how the Norse are, were integral to the wedding ceremony. In fact, it's how a girl was even shown to be on the market. When a girl came of age for marriage, which is young, but far older than just about anywhere else in ancient Europe, a father let it be known that she was available for marriage by gifting his daughter an empty sheath she would attach to her belt or girdle. Now, this didn't mean she or her father would have to accept the first knife just plopped in. Many women in Viking culture didn't wed until their mid-twenties. If a suitor liked the girl, he would put a puko blade in the sheath, at which the girl would keep if she was interested in him as consent for him to attempt a courtship. Men would sometimes doll up these pukos to try and curry more favor. However, it is noted by some historians that girls would also place blades into other girls' holsters. It's unknown if it correlates with same-sex romance or friendship. Blades will return in prominence a few more times in this countdown. Tradition number nine is that of the pregame. In the days before a wedding, the bride and grooms would be separated so as to shed their old selves in preparation for finding their new selves with one another. For the bride, this meant being stripped of old clothing and any symbols of her unwed status such as her kransen, a gilt circulette worn by Scandinavian girls on their heads, situated on the hairline. If you've seen the children's movie How to Train Your Dragon, the character Astrid wears one. These are symbols of virginity, and by removing her kransen in preparation for her bridal hair, which we'll touch on in the next segment, she was shedding her innocence. During this time, the bride also cleansed herself in a bathhouse. Hot stones would be placed into water to produce steam, and she would be accompanied by mother, sister, teachers, friends, or any other woman she desired the company of. The bride used birch twigs as switches on their skin to less than metaphorically beat out any dirt and symbolically wash away the bride's maiden status. Once the bath was finished, the bride was doused with cold water to close the pores and end the cleansing. Grooms didn't have it as easy as they usually do, and they also underwent symbolic rituals. His attendants would be his father, married brothers, or other married male friends. In order to rid themselves of any bachelorhood and destroy all vestiges of the unmarried self, Viking men participated in a symbolic sword ceremony by breaking into a grave. That's right, pre-wedding night, the husband-to-be would grab a pickaxe and get to work on burying the dead and retrieve a sword from an ancestor skeleton. Through this action, he entered death as a boy and emerged into life as a man reborn. After this, he too would attend the bathhouse, beat himself raw with twigs, while gaining insight and instruction on husbandly and fatherly duties from his attendants. Tradition number eight is, as mentioned, the bridal crown. The bridal crown represents a literal crown, but also that of a natural crown aka hair, which was more crucial to the Vikings than any other part of a woman, as it symbolized virility and sensuality. When it came time for her to remove her kransen, the bride would receive her bridal crown from her mother. This bridal crown would be adorned with endless ornaments, crystals, animal bones, rune stones, but it could also be made of purely natural materials and decorated with flowers, straw, wood, and vines. The longer the hair and the more ornaments it had, the better off the couple was believed to be. The next morning, the bride's hair would be tied up and covered with a cloth to show her status as a wife. Married Viking women would not always continue to cover their hair, but would wind it back into braids, buns, ponytails, and other risen hairstyles. Tradition number seven is in the garb. The hair of the bride was the most important aesthetic element. Everything else seemingly falls by the wayside. The bride often wore a long linen gown embellished with beads or intricate embroidery. The groom donned his newest and brightest of tunic and trousers, and also often linen and embroidered. Both parties would don a belt, and the groom's being a symbol of his strength and ability to protect Protect. The more weapons holstered, the better, but the groom always carried a pickaxe or hammer at least. The bride's was a symbol of her fertility, the clasp of her bridal belt intricate and dainty, drawing the eye as a reminder of what is to come when she and the groom are alone. Vikings loved to wear jewelry and wedding attire was no exception. The bride would wear a necklace, earrings, bracelets, often made of silver or gold and often more than one layer. The groom would wear a brooch or an arm ring, symbolizing his status and power. The final layer would be exactly that, an extra layer. Viking Vikings lived in cold climates, and it was common for them to wear coats or cloaks to keep warm. Seeing as the Viking wedding ceremony exclusively happened outside, no matter the season, a fur coat usually was of great importance. The groom's coat was usually a dark color, an animal he or a man in his family had personally hunted. This shows his prowess as a man and his role as a provider. The woman's fur coat would be a pale color, a symbol of her purity, and as the sweet animal captured by the ferocious hunter. Tradition number six is tying the knot. This classic wedding phrase is one that used to be quite 
quite literal. Called a hand fasting ceremony, a multitude of pagan religions had their own versions of this. For example, the Roman brides as mentioned in the Bumblebee video, Top 10 Scary Marriage Traditions in Ancient Rome, wear an intricate knot belt that must be undone by the groom. The use of the knot to symbolize the joining of couples originates with the Celts, who were famous for the symbolic use of knots and knot patterns. Hand fasting in the most traditional of senses was done by the Vikings, wherein the couple's hands are tied together with some cord or cloth by the officiant, quite literally binding them and officiating their marriage. They are tying the knot. Moreover, this practice was important to the Vikings as it indicated that the couple was getting married by choice, not by force. The couples I mentioned at the beginning of our video incorporated hand fasting in their ceremonies, but even those not recreating Viking weddings still participate as the trend is popular in Europe. Apart from exchanging rings, house keys, and tying the knot, the Viking bride and groom also exchanged swords. This symbolized the transfer of protection between the grooms and the bride's families. They would each exchange ancient swords from their own families, thus why the groom went and dug one up pre-wedding night. Furthermore, it united the two families that were now responsible for supporting and protecting one another. Tradition number five is the godly blessing. First and foremost, Viking weddings always and only took place on Fridays, otherwise known as Frigg's Day or Freya's Day, as the queen goddess represented marriage, love, and fertility. To hold a marriage on any other day than one of the Norse goddesses would have been a bad omen. Viking wedding rituals stated that the wedding also had to be held between the end of the harvest and before the snowfall, and that you needed to accumulate enough food and shelter for everyone invited. You also had to have enough bride ale for the new couple to drink for the first moon cycle of their wedding. Meanwhile, during the feast post ceremony, the hammer or pickaxe that the groom carries as part of his groom's attire would finally play its role. The bride was expected to ask for Thor's blessing, and so the pickaxe or hammer wielded by the groom, meant to represent Majon, is placed on the bride's lap. The placement of the symbol of Thor's manhood in between the bride's womb and hoo-ha is highly symbolic, as he represented male fertility and was believed by playing into this cruel joke, he may deliver you, the bride, strong children. Tradition number four is a cat in a box. As the groom would hand over his house keys to the bride, the congregation of those witnessing the wedding would bestow the gift of life to fill the home in preparation for children. Cats. Lots of cats. This was done in to honor Freya, the goddess of love, who according to legend, drove a chariot led by cats. Nursing female cats and their kittens were often seen as the most ideal to give, as they would be a representation of the bride's future to come, and help her set up the household and get into the routine of caring for something small and defenseless. Well, only semi. I've had my fair share of cat scratches and bites. I would argue they defend themselves just fine. Tradition number three is honeymoon. Have you ever wondered where the word honeymoon came from? Well, it comes from the Scandinavian practice of drinking honeymead, which nowadays is pretty hard to get a hold of. It takes a long time to make small batches and requires tedious preservation. But man, it is incredible, so if you get a chance to try it, you absolutely should, as long as you're over 19. And you needed enough of this delicious honeymead made and provided by friends and family to last you the entire duration of your first moon cycle, one month after your wedding, as it was believed to increase the chance of conceiving a child. As you can imagine, loose inhibitions would lead to a higher likelihood. It's also a legal requirement for the bride and groom to drink bride ale together at their post-wedding feast, as their union was only binding once they did so. The first serving was presented to the groom by his wife in a vessel known as the Loving Cup. The bride might recite a formal verse while presenting the ale. Before drinking it, the groom consecrated the ale to Thor by making the sign of the hammer over it, and toasted to Odin. He sipped and passed the cup to his bride, who made a toast to Freya before drinking. Tradition number two is giving chase. When your wedding ceremony is done nowadays, the bride and groom leave while their attendees applaud and whoop, and everyone meets with everyone later, sometimes at a secondary location for post-wedding festivities. However, in Viking weddings, this wasn't the case. Your first job as a bride and groom was to aggressively compete in a competition as if you were children again. A race. Called the bride running, or alternately the bridegroom's ride, this ritual originated in pagan days where the bridal and groom parties, as well as the bride and groom's additional guests, had to race to the feast location. Whichever party lost served liquor to all the winnings all night. You better hope you have an athletic family. Once in the feast hall, the groom buried the sword into the ceiling, and the depths of which the sword sunk symbolized the enduring nature of the union. Things changed in the Christian days, however, and the fun run turned simply into the two parties walking separately from the site of the ceremony to the feast, which is how we've ended up with the far more boring modern version we do today. When Christianity spread, it also carried the tradition of the marriage door from Rome. The Christian Viking version was the groom actually blocking the door so that the bride had to enter with his assistance, completing her symbolic journey 
journey from maidenhood to marriage. Tradition number one is animal sacrifice. Despite the wealth of Viking wedding knowledge that seems to be available, I will commentate briefly on how reconstructing their ceremonies has proven to be immensely difficult. This is because when the Viking sagas were first written, Christianization had already started wiping out their traditional cultures, temples, runestones, and overall beliefs, leaving many details undocumented or struck off the record. However, we are very confident that sacrifice made its way into marriage ceremony. The sacrifice was to draw attention of the gods to the ceremony and assure their presence and blessings, and so animals associated with fertility were the ones used. For Thor, a goat. For Freya, a sow. And for Freya, a boar or horse. The Gothi, the person responsible for the wedding, usually sacrificed the animal right at the wedding site. The animal's blood was collected in a bowl and placed on the altar. Then, a bundle of fur twigs was used to be dipped in the blood and splatter it on the couple, conferring the blessings of the gods. The blood is then drizzled over little figures of the gods placed at the altar, all meant to symbolize the union of them and regular people. And yes, Rune and Elizabeth, Dalseth, and Dorian and Charlie Eust are couples who recreated authentic Viking weddings in 2015 and 19, also included this part of the ceremony. Thank you once again for tuning into Bumblebee. I hope you enjoyed the video. Be sure to take some time to like and subscribe to stay up to date, and I'll see you next time.